Okay. Okay. I think it's time to start the meeting. So, uh, good morning and uh, good evening. I'm Dr. Pang Yun Cho. Uh, how are you? Today is the 21st ICC webinar. And because of COVID, uh, I think almost all the international conferences has been shifted to virtual webinars. Uh, after 2020, Changgum Four Runs, the platform of ICC webinar was set up to share the topics related to the craniofacial platic surgery by Chang'an craniofacial team, uh, your old friend. Uh, in the past 20 webinars, uh, we already have uh, learned a lot from the presenter, uh, either from Chang'an or internationally. Today, just today, we are so happy to have our mentor, Professor Yue Chen, to come with us and uh, we'll present one of his great achievement, craniofacial fiber dysplasia. Uh, Professor Chen has experienced numerous uh, difficult cases of craniofacial fiber dysplasia in his 40 more years and uh, published a bunch of uh, literatures in journals and uh, cooperate his uh, personal series with NIH to establish the treatment protocol for this disease. So are you uh, guys ready for the lessons? So let's welcome Professor Chen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhou. And uh, thank you for all the international uh, scholars. And uh, I haven't seen you for a while. And while in the COVID-19 that we only meet in the webinar if possible. I'm happy to be with you today that I can share one of my favorite topic is the cranial facial fiber dysplasia. Well, the cranial facial fiber dysplasia is not a new disease, it's an old disease. And whenever there's a human being, there's the disease of this bone disease. And in the first slide that I show you in this skull, is from the architectural journal where this is a thousand years ago that in Europe and found this fiber dysplasia in the mesilla area. This is a cranial facial fiber dysplasia begins with a fibro osseous lesion and most because of this gene a mutation and the bone is replaced by fibro osseous tissue wherever either in the cranial or body. Well, it's always been classified as monoostotic, which is about 80%, or polyostotic, which is small or smaller, and sometimes associated with a condition called acute opera syndrome with the, with the endocrine problems. Well, this is a natural course. Usually it begins in childhood because it's gene problem. So in the emb embryo, there's a development of problems and progressively in puberty and in adolescence. And it will affected by the growth hormone and sometimes affected by trauma. And it does have cystic degeneration in some cases. The malic degeneration is rare. It's about 1% or a little bit more. Well, in our population, in my series of uh, patients, the male and female is about the same, but female seems to be a little bit more. It usually presented early in the age. The mean age is about in the teenager. And the first onset usually is about the teenager and can be very early in time. In our series, we do have four cases of associated endocrine disorders. One is the mccune Ambrose syndrome, as you can see here. And the, the other one is a pituitary adenoma in a boy and a vascular malformation. 
Here is a macumba eyebrow syndrome, a female. You can see the whole skull is a fibro osseous lesion over the skull. And she has a problem of the fibro dysplasia in the extremity. And you can see there's a fracture two times. Another one with the face, the whole face with uh, uh, osseous fibrous tissue. And you can see the bulging, just a lion face. You can see the skull or the bone like this and multiple fracture before. And here is the extremities. So this is uh, Albright syndrome. One of the boys that I treated with uh, local regional excision, but grows back quickly. And uh, the bone graft is completely replaced by the fibrous uh, dysplasia tissue. And as you can see, five years after the patients re uh, regrow this area. And we found that his uh, body height is so big compared to his father. And we suspect that there's something wrong with the uh, pituitary gland and found out it's uh, uh, adenoma of the pituitary gland. And the growth hormone keep on growing, still managing the fibro tissue and have this giant uh, syndrome. We published this case, so-called we call Taiwanese giant. And this case that being controlled by uh, uh, chemotherapy and uh, by the neurosurgeon have uh, take care of this adenoma. The last one is a vascular malformation combined with fibro dysplasia. As you can see, here is fibro dysplasia along with some vascular hyper and vascularity. And the patient's history with uh, injury and bleeding and, with, and blindness as well. We did the surgery and released it and patient uh, have the blindness improved for uh, uh, 20 years, a uh, gradually declined. I will talk about this, about the, the, the blindness as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. As, I, as you can see in our cranial facial fibrosis, which is a completely separated from what we classify monoostotic or polyostotic. We only talk about cranial facial fibrodysplasia area where we classify it as a cranial facial fibrodysplasia, whether with syndrome or not with syndrome. And this, that 100% of the patients complain about the facial mass or deformity, and about half of them involved in the uh, orbital area, whereas the zygoma, sphenoid, and sometimes muscle as well. And well, we have 12% have some vision loss or decreased vision because of orbital area involvement. And 3% have the pain because of cystic generation and expansion whenever there's a menstruation. They are all females. The typical case like this is this uh, boy with the uh, eye is proptotic and displaced and found it early in the uh, five years old. You can see the x-ray that shows, CD shows like this involvement of the sphenoid, zygoma, and sphenoid body. Another one in the orbital area, in the frontal uh, orbital area with the body mass. As you can see, the x-ray is quite localized in the frontal orbital roof. The other one involved more in the zygoma, and you can see the body of the frontal zygoma and mesula. Even more is the mesula di displacement down, downward like this. Very most severe like this, it is bulging out the whole, whole uh, orbital mesula nasal area where the body mass, they, they treat it with a local uh, herb drug and cause this ulceration. This is not malignancy. As you can see here, the whole cranium is involved. And the skull size is about 30% uh, more than the average. Sometimes uh, it's especially female, like this 12 years old girl, and with bulging the left side, left side, the globe. And you can see CT shows the sphenoid bone, orbital digoma involvement. And the patient refused to have uh, early treatment but two years after, you can see the change of the uh, involved bone by cystic generation and then cause blindness. And the similar on this 
uh, patients. This is a nurse at the side bulging of the opiates with painful uh, area. In 97, still it's a osseous lesion, but one year after, where the patient complained about pain in the eye area because of 60 generation of the right eye uh, region where the private bone being cystic degeneration. In this patient, you can see that involved is not only the skull, but also mandible. This is 60 degeneration happens. And in some series of patients in our series, this is Professor Law and his fellow and have finished this paper by reviewing all the patients in cranial facial center is more than 112 and 8% of them have cystic degeneration. And the female is more than the male. And they have a certain uh, enlargement and with a pen. Uh, four of them deteriorate, deteriorate their visual acuity or diplodia and two blind. And this has been published in 2007 in the Journal of Neurosurgery. Well, as a surgeon, we always want to cure the, pain, the, the disease if possible, but it's not possible to completely cure in some patients. The surgical indication for those patients are for aesthetic reason because of the protrusion mass or facial asymmetry, or functionally because of the optical dystopia and visual disturbance, or some patient with malocclusion. And very rarely that patient have very severe pain or even malignant degeneration that we should have some kind of surgical treatment. So the indication is by the patients, they complain about the facial aesthetic problems or some functional problems. The surgical management can be simply shaving if there's a bulging or contouring of the protrusion. Or if possible that we can wide excise it and then replace this excised area with uh, uh, patient's skull or rib bone graft, completely replace the disease bone. This is what we want, if possible, that we can wide excise all the lesion and then replace with autogenous bone graft from skull or rib. Some patients have uh, vision problems and we thought we can do some optical decompression because it's been encased by the fiber dysplasia where we want to decompress it hopefully that vision can be improved. And if possible, the patient have some uh, occlusal problems, we can do OGS, by right? The full one, or such as breed, or even the segmental osteotomies. The bone of the fibular dysplasia after osteotomy heals quite nicely, very similar to the normal bones. Well, this is uh, in 1990 that we published one paper talking about the area of the disease uh, involvement, like the zone one, where is the uh, orbital area, frontal area, where we can totally excise it and then replace with uh, uh, autogenous bone if possible. In the uh, zone two is a hair bearing area where we don't want to treat it unless this is combined with a surgery with a zone one. And surely in the zone three is a skull base, which is, uh, a uh, very in dangerous area. If there's no uh, indication like uh, blindness or uh, painful cystic, otherwise we, we don't touch it. And zone four is the area where the tooth was buried because of the mild occlusion. Sometimes we should do some osteotomies, but the, the lesion is there. We try to keep that uh, segment because it's a still functional. If we totally excise, then we'll replace with Free, uh, free vascular bone graft, but still need denture and all the function were distorted. So if possible, we try to preserve this kind of occlusal function by doing OGS only, not total excision. Well, this uh, rewrite it in the textbook. So this area will be similarly that mentioned in the textbook. I just started with all this kind of a simple uh, shaving, like this patient with uh, Macule eyebrow syndrome and have multiple fracture in the other area, area. But for the facial part, this bulging bone that we can shave it out. And we can do uh, alternate bone graft for the nose to augment the nose and have the face look much better. Same as this uh, female have Macule eyebrow syndrome with a bulging and white face 
and we try to shave it out, remove the bulging part and make her look better. And this is uh, uh, after surgery. And this is 15 years after surgery. Although this is a macumor upper syndrome, the whole skull has been diseased, but you can see the vision is okay. No involvement, no involvement occlusion is all right. So it's a kind of homogeneously involved all the bone, but still functioning. Although her uh, long bones easily fractured, but for the cranial facial bone seems to be quite uh, stationary. And the other one, other type, this is a frontal orbital area. Here's a bulging here. And we know that this is fiber dysplasia by looking at X-ray. And this is a lesion. You can see in the, during the operation, the normal bone and fiber space bone is different. It's more vascularized, reddish. And so we can totally, almost totally completely this excise it in this local area and then replace, reconstruct it. At that time, you can see that I used the rib graft, split it and uh, reconstruct the forehead and temporal and the, and the roof. This is uh, four years after. You can see here, the bone heals well, although there's a little bit of irregularity because of the big graft, but it heals well. And because the fiber dysplasia is totally excised, replaced with the autosinous bone, so it's a cure. You can see that eight years after surgery, heals well and no more surgery. And this is before and after. Another one is a female. You can see the left side frontal orbital uh, area involvement from the CTs. You can see the, on the left side here, this time that we almost totally excised all this disease bone. And at that time that we used the terrato splitted area bone to reconstruct it. So at that time we used the mini plate already and then reconstructed the defect. And as you see in this case, it's almost total excision and then reconstructed with autogenous scar bone. You can see that here is the reconstructed bone either of the roof side and here is 14 years after surgery. Remains cured. Eye position, all right. Side, uh, one side. Yeah, it's just like treated with osteoma. If we can totally excise it and then replace it with the uh, bone graft. This uh, bone graft is from the cavalia bone or iliac bone. And we, we want to cover the nasal cavity with uh, uh, gallia frontalis flat so that there's prevention of any infection through the nose to the reconstructed area. You can see this is. Uh, uh, gallia frontalis muscle and put into in between the nasal cavity and the reconstructed region. Here is the after surgery. The CT shows the bone graft healed, stable. Some place with wires. In th that time, that mostly it was wires. You can see here is the uh, esmoid area. This is a patient after surgery and eight years after surgery. Three quarter view. Interesting is the, the, the girls or the growing uh, the, the child. This is child that with a right side digoma mesula area region. As you can see from uh, this operation field, here is the zygoma and upper mesula. We totally excise it and then replace it with a rib graft with split it. This is easily that we can insert a smoke groove and then wire on the top part. So this is graft that we replace the disease bone with rib graft. And this is uh, after surgery one year and this is after surgery 14 years. Here's almost cure, although that we do not completely remove all the disease bone at the zygoma 
osteoporosis. <clears throat> so this is 14 years after surgery remains cured. This gentleman have uh, operated before that at the local hospital where they want to excise a uh, protruded uh, bony mass, but turned out to be bleeding a lot. So they stopped the surgery by only incision, exploration, and then quickly close back in compression. So many years after, then come to us and we see that this has uh, been operated before, but this uh, puppet dysplasia has not been really removed. So what we did is that through this original scar and expose it and then excise as much as we can safely, try to preserve the bottom floor, uh, remain its in position, and then all the defects of the digoma, from upper mesilla, of the floor, and we all replaced it with rig graft at that time. You can see here is a big rig graft from the nasal bone area to the digomatic arch. And then we bridge it with a uh, uh, rib to reconstruct the orbit and then to the upper mesilla. And here is after surgery, eight years after surgery, 20 years after surgery. And no more surgery, you can see that it's almost cured, although that we do not completely size it, but it remains stationary and uh, patient can have this part of the disease being cured. So almost a, a radical surgery is helpful to do this. And this is patient of the frontal orbital area. And we can do two stages. One is the orbital area, the other is the OGS. And after OGS, then we can have this result. We can compare before and after. This is three years after. Another patient in the mesolary area, we can shave in, have a temporary uh, improvement, but because of the malocclusion and protrusion of the mesola, we can do OGS, segmental osteotomy in this patients, and then have this kind of uh, aesthetic improvement. And the bone heals quite well, as you can see here. Shaving itself do not remove, they completely solve the problem of occlusion, and yet, Segmental osteotomy can improve the aesthetic. This is a patient that I just share with you uh, because of the progressiveness of this uh, orbital nasal that digoma and mesial protrusion uh, with herb drug. And we biopsy many times, and it turned out to be only inflammation, not malignancy. Combined with the neurosurgeon, they completely exposed plasma of the nerve on both sides. And then we can safely remove all the disease bone of the protruded part, including the necrotic skin, and then end up with the defect of this frontal, orbital, nasal, mesilla defect. When that time we reconstruct it with iliac bone graft, rib graft, and have the orbital reconstructed, intercancel distance reconstructed, and mesilla. So this is during surgery, it's 1982, where you can see this reconstructed with all wires and bone graft. And then we close this skin defect with a rotational lateral facial flap and skin graft on this. And then we revise the skin graft part uh, six months after, and then close up with this uh, kind of face. Yeah, this is about two years after surgery, of the initial surgery. And you can see the face longer so that in seven years after this initial surgery, we do the OGS to have a better proportion of the mid face. You can see the improvement of the whole face where the bone graft side had uh, been healed and we use that for the uh, rhinoplasty at that time. And as you can see from this face can change to the face when she get married. It's a kind of uh, achievement for a cranial face surgeon that we can really reconstruct the whole face and turn out to be really non nearly normalized. We talk about a little bit of the nerve compression. On that last case that you can see, the optic nerve is being completely decompressed and then we can re reset the, the disease bone. And I mentioned about this patient uh, uh, almost blind because of vascular lesion and uh, along with the fibrodysplasia. And I did it 
who is a neurosurgeon that decompress it and the patient can get some vision, protective vision for many years. And this is this girl that I show you in the age of 12. And the CT shows uh, sphenoid optic area involvement, but this is 1993, but two years after she came back with blindness on the normal eye, the right eye. This is because of cystic degeneration of the sphenoid fiber dysplasia, as you can see here. If I show you this here, comparing to the before, this is a cystic degeneration and compressed not down the digit side, but to the normal side. So that caused the normal side of the eye blind. We did the emergency day that decompressed all this area with a neurosurgeon, but turned out to be the eye side do not come back. This is a 93 and 95, you can see the cystic degeneration of the sphenoid bone and uh, fiber dysplasia and compressed uh, the optic nerve. And this uh, at the age of 20, that after this decompression, the right eye blind, so that it's now a dystopia. And this uh, at age of 29, she got married and we follow up her constantly, but station stationary. This is a 21 year old uh, nurse and have a complaint about the right eye painful expansion after a few years of treatment of her mandible uh, protrusion, but to not be the right eye side uh, lesion or the fiber dysplasia to not be cystic degeneration. And this acute painful uh, compression that caused blind almost blindness on the right side. So what we did is that we excised this area through the cranial facial incision with a neurosurgeon and then decompress all this uh, cystic and then we reconstruct it with the uh, uh, rig graft so that uh, this uh, area has been restored and eye vision is protected. And we surely uh, reported along with Dr. Lois uh, in Journal of Neurosurgery about cystic degeneration. And this lady have some other area of the cystic degeneration with painful cystic that we remove and regraft it and the mandible remove and regraft it for many times. And, and she get married and have one um, girl that uh, grows quite normally. Well, as you can see, we do have patients have a sphenoid bone involvement, about 35 patients. And their optimum involved is about half, uh, about two, half of this, about 25% of this uh, craniofacial bone uh, area that involved. And we do have this kind of patient, about two thirds have visual dysplasia, either dystopia or due to weakness or the so-called uh, loss of vision in uh, six cases. So in this, that we think that with optical decompression can help. So we try to do decompression when we do cranial optical reconstruction. And at the same time, if the patient have the lesion around the frontal upper area, then we try to do so-called prophylactic optimal decompression. And the result is that we, if the neurosurgeon is skillful and can have the same vision, and in some patients, we do have improvement of this life size. So this is a good girl and bo uh, girl and boy that have uh, optimal canal encasement. And it is, you can see the x-ray is like this. And at the same time of the frontal opto uh, uh, reconstruction, we take out the frontal bone and then we decompress optic nerve. Here is the after surgery. You can see here is a big decompression uh, during this uh, surgery. And here's a, a reconstruction with autogenous bone graft with after excision of this disease bone. This is a, uh, at the age of seven years that when he has a surgery and 10 years after, and this is 25 years old. Uh, it, and you can see here, this is remains open and bone graft heals. And after growing up, you can see the optical roof still thick, but it remains quite well. Interesting that is in 2002, the in in the New England Journal of Medicine and from uh, University of San Francisco reported along with the NIH that they have acute eye syndrome. 
26 cases, and uh, uh, all, all this have 38 patients. The optic canal are affected almost then, but only two have monocular visual impairment. So they argue about that the optic nerve is uh, engagement is not the cause of the blindness or the visual acuity lesion. So they doubt about optic nerve decompression. Is that really necessary or the cause of this optic nerve decompression is necessary? That's why we review all the 18 cases that we do with, with decompression and found that the patients that we obeyed before, this is 10 years after uh, we first follow up and turn out to be some of the patients do progressively decrease their vision. Here is the improvement after our surgery, but re remains improvement in uh, five, but one get uh, even worse. And some of the patients deteriorated, gradually going to be blind and some poor. That means that actually the optic decompression, optic canal decompression itself do not prevent the progressiveness of the disease if the bone is still there. This is so the case that I will share with you in 1990. We did the frontal orbital uh, reconstruction as well as the decompression. But the patient at the age of nine and 17, see 10 years after some of the unresected area regrow back. And then the patient have dystopia and vision acuity is decreased. As you see at the age of 22, the uh, non-operated area remains growing. This means that if this uh, remaining part of the further dysplasia, they will uh, still grow. So it's not only the optimal canal area, it's the whole unresected area still growing and can compress or displace the open. So then we do some shaving and uh, reconstruction, it should look better, but the eye vision, uh, dystopia and vision is not recovered. You can see here is the decompression part remains open, but the, because of dystopia and somehow the optic nerve is being, uh, being degenerated. And this is uh, 40 years after surgery, 16 years, 19 years. And they are still open, but does not completely prevent the optic nerve uh, or, or optic vision that the deterioration. So what we say that uh, seems to be that it's the pure prophylactic is not really necessary because if you cannot completely remove the disease bone, you cannot prevent it. So if there's uh, still some remaining bone there, it should not indicated for pure become uh, prophylactic. And only when there's a sudden dose of the lesion, then we can do that. Or if you do the frontal orbital resection and reconstruction, you can do the same time. Oh, this is uh, complications that I should a little bit uh, review about this and mention to everybody. Any kind of surgery have complications. If you operate it on in the orbital area, you can have a blockia or oculomotor dysfunction or end of summers, sometimes cosmetically, it's not as good. And the bone bar infection sometimes happens if you do not have a good infection and CSRD usually heals well. And you regard it happens, you can do some shaving. Here's uh, the one that I have, this uh, infection of the bone graft. This is 1999, where I have the infection because of the frontal connection uh, to the nasal cavity. And we do not treat quite well, and that's why I have some infection. And we do treat it conservatively, and the patient surely not very happy, but kind of late heals, and here's many years after. Compared to this, you can, and 99 is about three years after, this is about uh, 10 years after. It heals well with some scar. This is a case that treated outside hospital. They do not reconstruct it. It's only reset the disease area. You can see the x-ray shows complete absence of the bone because they reset that big piece of the skull bone, turned out to be displaced. And surely because of the no orbit and well, dystopia quite a lot. Well, this is a kind of uh, a skull defect or frontal orbital bone defect. So we recounted it with uh, autogenous bone graft and try to uh, build up better shape of the surely uh, the opits and as well as the frontal bone. And here is a few years after, not completely well, but it's all right. And this is case of frontal, the zygoma 
uh, maxilla area, which is relatively easy that we can remove it. But you can see here's the skin discoloration, mild. And after recession, usually the skin discoloration will be even more, even worse. So prepare for that because of the uh, expanded skin after recession, it will remain quite skin discoloration and a little bit de depression. Here is cosmetically, it's uh, not the kind of perfect. About the reoperation, if we are doing only contouring, then it's possible that you, you, you do recontouring again and again. So you can see that in 17 patients, I do conservative contouring. I did 32 operations for recontouring because coming back and we do some shaving. But if you do a radical resection, as you see here in the 10 cases, there's no more recontouring. But in the partial ones, yes, there's a non reset area, you will do some recontouring when if possible. So most of patients, if that involved in a small area, you can possibly particle excision and bone graft. If there's an extensive wide area, then you possibly prepare for the reoperation or recontouring and if necessary. And OGS, we do it uh, at the adult age. So in five patients, we do not have any Reoperation again. And this is uh, the patient that we do rip graft. And when we, we shave in, you can see that bone heals quite well. And we do biopsy, the junction of the bone and the fibrodysplasia, and it actually heals quite normally as the normal bone healing. Well, malignancy happens only once in our series. So it's about 1%. But in my own clinic, my own clinic they reviewed all the orthopedic and all the departments of. Uh, the surgery and those patients in their report, they have malignant degeneration about 2.5%, including osteosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, control sarcoma, or malignant histiocytoma. And we have one case of this histiocytoma. In this case, it's not a malignant case, but the patient complained about painful uh, manipulation. Well, the, the oral surgeon biopsy many times, but should not be not uh, malignancy, but because they worry about this malignancy, so we do uh, reset it and reconstruct it with uh, vascular ileal bone with a microsurgeon at that time with uh, Professor uh, Chen. And you can see here is a vascularized bone and here, and heals well, it's two years after, five years after, and it's 14 years after, and even 20 years after. So the patient keep on follow up in my, in my clinic and happy they come back. This is one with uh, malignant degeneration of uh, fibrous histiocytoma, malignant histiocytoma. And we published this case uh, by Professor Zheng, uh, Zheng Minghui, and in the of plastic surgery in this case. In the last about 40 years that we do this kind of case and publish more than 10 papers. And so in 2010, that NIH want to have a consensus meeting in Bethesda. And so I presented uh, all our series and I'm the only cranial physical surgeon being invited along with um, pediatricians and uh, endocrine, uh, endocrine specialists and the basic science. And we guide it, uh, discuss it and about the management. So we come out some kind of guideline in this paper. I think if, if you want, you can have this paper uh, uh, Copied and you can study that. It's been written by uh, Professor Lee. He is in UC uh, San Francisco, and he is she is a student of Dr. Carbon in Harvard. And we all uh, also this in this we have 93 references, and in that about eight articles is from Changgeng in our series. We've been invited into the uh, uh, textbook where you can see how the cranial facial how the displays are managed in the different part of the textbook in the chapters about this, even in, uh, in Nelligan's first uh, surgery journal that we have this. So finally, if the take home, uh, home message, take home message to you is that cranial facial fiber dysplasia is easily that you can diagnose by the clinical history. non painful bulging mass in the face for a long time and you can guess in the 99% is fiber dysplasia. And if you can prove it by CT and if not necessary biopsy, but it's really necessary to do biopsy. 
CT scan is enough. And you can do it, uh, treat it conservatively, shaving or recession, if possible, you can reset it as clean and then reconstruct it with spoon graft. And prophylactic, um, prophylactic open nerve decompression is not really advised. Uh, only acute enough compression and during the massive recession, and you can do that as a new surgeon, especially a skillful new surgeon, otherwise you will damage the open nerve. So the CT scan is very important and helpful. So the role is that when first patient, first time you see it, you see the patient, then you build up a, a CD scan and for database, and then you follow up uh, one or two years every uh, uh, one or two years. And if the patients consider about recession or reconstruction, surely that you should do the CD and then to compare before and after. And after the treatment, and then you can follow up every three or five years. And if there's a symptom size change or mass increased or painful lesion, then you should do that. So this is uh, your take home hand uh, message. Thank you for your listening and hope that you can have some kind of image or some kind of idea that how you manage this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Chen for your very excellent the talk. The talk. Uh, I have one question stuff for Professor Chen. As you mentioned about the partial resection and the radical resection. So uh, in order to no recurrence for the, the fiber dysplasia or to prevent the further uh, contouring surgery, we all want to try the radical uh, uh, excision. So, but uh, what is your, some of the key anatomy you will choose only for partial resection? Yeah. As, as I just mentioned, if the zone area belonging to two, three, Four means that hair bearing area, skull base, or tooth bearing area, where you cannot totally size it because number one, dangerous. Number two, a hair bearing is not necessary. Number three is functional because of tooth bearing. So in those three areas where we want to preserve it, don't touch it. But if the lesion is in the zone one where you can comfortably reconstruct it after your recession, what I mean is that do not create more ugly face after your surgery. At least that you can improve the facial aesthetic and by resection and then by your reconstruction. If that, in that point, then you can excise as much as you can in the zone one. Mm -hmm. okay. If the, there's a tooth bearing or gingiva area, you try to keep the gingiva untouched or achieving only because you want to preserve the teeth and the occlusion. So this is my principle of recession is that luckily if that is a small area in the zone one, then you can see as my patients, you can totally size, you know, try it with occlusion as well. But if you cannot reconstruct it comfortably, like if the whole orbit is involved, nose is involved, you take it out and you can try it and end up with anosomus, dystopia and ugly, then you don't want to do that. And that time you do more conservatively, but you prepare for secondary contouring. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Professor Chen. And uh, one question is from Dr. Mohinor. Uh, he asking, uh, what is Professor Chen's view on using artificial bone substitute like MEPOR or PEEK implants? Yes, it's been, uh, used actually, and uh, in the area of like uh, frontal bone or upper maxilla, where you do not have any contamination or connection with sinus, nas, nose, or anywhere where potentially infection, then you can use that. I will recommend it is that, uh, number one, don't use the uh, the same bone that being used is that the fiber displaced bone, take it out and shave it and auto graft and then graft back. It's been used, but it will resolve and deformity. And you can use uh, the MEPOR or the others in the area of the frontal or parietal where there's no connection or potential infection. And I think it's safe. Occasionally they were used on uh, the titanium uh, mesh, a 
as well. I think it's all right to use that, just like uh, trauma to cases. The next question is, uh, in around what age the disease will become stabilized and how long should we follow up these patients? Thank you. The disease usually are um, not growing that kind of fast or not obviously after adolescent. It means that after adult by age of about 18 or 20 in male or 16 or 16, uh, 18 in female, it will stop growing as quick as in the adolescent. So after that, this is a kind of uh, slightly growing, except some patients have vascular lesion or sixth degeneration, as I mentioned in females, or endocrine problems like pituitary gland, uh, adenoma, as growth hormones keep on growing. Those are the very special ones that will keep on growing. Otherwise, after like 18, 20 years, the growth of this fibroid dysplasia is slowed down and very mildly grows. So uh, it, it, you can say that it stopped growing, but in some special cases that you should worry about. And how long you should wait or follow up? I will say that after adults, if the patient can accept this deformity, do not want to any surgery, then I will uh, follow up every two or three years. And if that station is the same, do not change much. You can follow up five or eight years after, and then patient may not be follow up if the patient is happy about that. So may I ask Professor Chen, uh, what is the longest uh, the patient you follow up so far? 40 years? So, as long as I am uh, I'm his or her surgeon, it's almost uh, 40 years. Okay. <laughs> because sometimes the patient will come back and just say hello to me and but this is not really necessary to follow up that long because it's just only kind of social uh, uh, kind of a relationship with the patients. But what I want to see, especially the optimal decompression patients, that I want to see any kind of a, uh, improvement or decretion. So that's why I call the patient back. And after adult, uh, like 20 or 20, uh, some more, Actually, the, the, the face changed that, not that much. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is that for partial resections or shaving, how do you plan the amount to be resected? Do you ever use the virtual surgical planning or and uh, patient-specific implants? In the last few years, uh, more and more uh, paper will come out, the so-called uh, simulation, how much excise it, and then maybe use non-autogenous uh, bone implant. Yes, I will do that if I have a new case coming in, but in the past, usually I don't. I, don't. I enjoy more of using this kind of so-called autogenous rib or autogenous bone graft, a kind of uh, uh, like a, uh, carpenter or artist to do it. And for now, uh, I think more interesting is that you can plan in the 3D CT or simulation so that reset part and then uh, we, we plan. I think this kind of a uh, simulation is, is uh, being encouraged. I will encourage the young surgeons to do that. Um, so your generation is much better than what I did before because you have this kind of tour simulation, and then hopefully that can have a much quicker and safer surgery. Okay. Okay, for the next questions is, uh, do you find uh, any resorption of the rib grafts and uh, for the orbital reconstruction? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Interesting that if your bone graft is fixed well in a closed space, there's very little resorption because the function still remains well. What I mean is that uh, some kind of unlaid bone grafts you are definitely being resolved. But this is a type of inlay and functionally support. So usually it won't resolve that much. So in that kind of an orbital reconstruction or in an upper maxilla reconstruction, it seems to be 
from a bigger space reduced to a small one. And it's functionally support the open or support the face. So the bone simply functionally remains function well, no, not resulting that much. Okay, thank you, Professor. And uh, any more questions from our audience? Okay, one question is from Japan, Dr. Honda. Uh, he's asking uh, how about recent trend of the numbers of cases in Taiwan? Is it increasing or decreasing? Ah, interesting. Uh, I've been asked that why you have a big series like this? Uh, because cranial facial fibrosis seems to be not that kind of a common. Yes, it's a kind of rare. No, in this recent years, the number do not increase and they do not decrease. I think it spread out to the young surgeons where they can handle that so that the young surgeon can handle the uh, fibrotic spiritual on the same principles as I mentioned, and they can treat it that. So none really needed to come to me. So I do not see as many uh, fibrotic spiritual cases as before because it's been spreaded or been treated somewhere. So I don't think that the instance will be decreased or increased uh, in the uh, last 20, 30 years. It will remain the same. The only thing is that in the early years, the accumulated or non-treated cases come to me or come to our cranial vein center in that stage. That's why that we have this kind of volume of the patients and so that we can get this kind of experience. So this is our um, so-called lucky time, our lucky period, but not means that at that time, the instance is higher. Okay, so uh, another question in from the Osakuana. Uh, professor, can titanium mesh replace bone graft in your cases presented? As I mentioned uh, just now, yes, in the area of the frontal area, in the area uh, of the parietal, if from the frontal orbital area where if that titanium is not exposed to the sinus or some area, yes, it, it can be replaced by that. Okay, okay. Professor, do you have any experience to see uh, there is any family history of a fibrodysplasia or any genetics uh, uh, relationship in the families? No, I do not see the whole uh, family with um, fiber dysplasia from the first or second generation. Now that I can remember, it seems to be not a kind of a genetic uh, or so-called uh, autosomal dominant recessive disease. It's a kind of um, just gene mutation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, any questions from the audience? Okay. If not, so, okay, one more <laughs> uh, from the Dr. Abu Laibi. Uh, professors, uh, it could be used the MEPOR reform material. Yeah. Okay. It could be used the MEPOR uh, reform materials or not. Uh, as I said, yes, right now, do the simulation and uh, you can uh, plan the excision area as long as, as I again, you do not expose your implant to the sinus or nasal cavity or you have enough soft tissue coverage. Yes, you can do that. Okay, so any more questions? Yes. If there is no more questions, uh, probably I'll get one more question from Dr. Wow. Uh, he's asking, one of the cases showed vascular malformation also. Does it mean that there could be some sort of the syndrome or sequence related together? Oh, yes. Uh, if that is um, polyostotic and uh, along with uh, Moncure-Albright syndrome, then it's partly it's a gene related. 
but for the simple craniofacial hyperdysplasia, as I described that it's belonging to the involvement on the craniofacial bone area, then it is not the gene problem. But for the vancuum eyebrow syndrome, yes, it's a gene problem. And uh, it's a kind of a uh, traditional or genetic problems that can inherit it. Okay. So any more questions? Okay, if not, I think the, today is a very uh, treasured time to have Professor Chen here with us. So I think probably we can have a group photo. So may I ask uh, all the audience in this webinar can turn on your photograph of, of your uh, beautiful face with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very, very, very much, much, much. It's very important, so I said twice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please be ready. Thank you for your participate particip participation. So I think in the first page I will take a photo. Okay. Okay. So I will count one, two, three, and the please say cheese. Okay. The first page. Uh, one, two, cheese. Thank you. And uh, now turn to the second page. Today, we are so happy to have the 130 the participation here. Okay. Okay, from Bo Fang. Okay, please cheese. One, two, cheese. Cheese. Thank you. Very nice. Okay, I think that so far we have a lot of friends and show your face. And uh, do you have any more questions you want to ask Professor Chen now? All right. If there is not, uh, we are so happy and to conclude this presentation and the thanks Professor Ray Chen again for his excellent presentation about the craniofacial fiber dysplasia. Yeah, and uh, I think time is very limited, but I have to show some information for all the audience in this webinar. Uh, since last year, 2020, the Changgum Forum so far, it has been about nine months already. So in 2021, we have uh, the brand new the Changgum Forum 2021. Uh, I think it's uh, the same. It's a webinar form, it's not the in-person form. And the date is, the, as you sh I show in the screen, the date is the November 6th and the November 7th. And this year, the topic, the major topic, it will be focusing on the surgery first, ocnotic surgery. So just as usual, and we prepare a lot of very, very excellent presentation with the video demonstration. And so we always welcome you to join. So please, and this is our program at a glance. So you can contact with Nancy or you can mail to our secretary as well. And we always welcome for you to uh, uh, join to this webinar. Although we cannot see face to face in person, but we always missing you, our old friend. And I have to introduce our next uh, ICC webinar. Two weeks later, we will invite it, uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Alice Ken in UT Southwestern and he will give us an online presentation about the topic treatment and the outcome of a single suture cranial synostosis. So please stay on tune two weeks later and see you. And thank you very much for your join. And uh, I have to say bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Chen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Yep. Nice day. Thank you. Oh, nice day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Okay. Uh, Chen Jiaming Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.
Diana Nikolova, thank you, Akulaibi. Thank you a lot. See you later, two weeks later. See you later. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. You're welcome.